I'm a doctor. I've been a doctor for a very long time. The medical profession can be extremely conservative um, and reluctant to change. And they don't like admitting that they maybe were doing the, the wrong things for many years or whatever the reasons might be. Um, or they, you know, a lot of their funding comes from, from drug manufacturers. Um, so they're, they're, they're loath to move away from drugs. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Um, give me just a second. We have a guest today, uh, Dr. David Cavan or Cavan. I'm not sure how to pronounce. I'm sure you'll correct me here in a second. My, my name's David Cavan. Cavan. Okay. But even in the UK, people struggle with it, so I'll answer to anything. No, it's okay, Cavan. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for doing this. I guess it's probably about mid evening there or something like that, 6 p.m. or something. I'm guessing. Yes, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Okay, so maybe not too late. So thank you for taking the time to do this. We had uh, we've had somebody else from the UK earlier today. Uh, Joe McCormick was here, I think, on Monday or Tuesday. Oh yeah. Anyway, so are, are, do you know who? She, are you familiar with her then? John McGee. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Are yeah, you are you associated with the public health collaboration as well? Um, I I I am a loosely yes. Not it. Okay. Well, why? Yeah, I'm not officially a member. But uh, I've done work with them and spoken at their meeting. Well, while we, why don't we start with this, giving you a little bit of, our, letting you give us a little bit of your background, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. So my name is David Cavan. I'm, I'm a physician. I'm what I think in most of the world would be called an endocrinologist. Um, and so for all my professional life, I've worked in medicine, largely uh, looking after people with diabetes um, within a hospital setting. And um, the nature of my that type of job is largely looking after people with, with type diabetes. But about 10 years ago, I became very interested in, in type 2 diabetes. And um, without going into the whole story now, but I became a bit disillusioned with a traditional medical model of seeing it as a medical condition that required medications and started actually to ask people about their diet and found that by modifying their diets, uh, people did often much better than with medications. So a lot of my work since then has been promoting a, a lifestyle approach to management of type 2 diabetes, uh, both through books that I've written and projects that I've uh, set up in, in UK and different parts of the world. Let me, uh, you know, it's interesting because you said you're an endocrinologist and, you know, obviously endocrinologists are dealing with a whole range of endocrine diseases and type type 2 diabetes obviously falls in there. But it seems it's type 2, B, type 2 diabetes has become so ubiquitous that like a lot of just standard GPs will manage that. And, and, and it's often the type 1s will go to the endocrinologist because that, that requires That's insulin right. and it's considered a little bit more challenging to manage. There's, there's higher stakes with managing insulin. Um how, um, you know, how did you focus mostly on type two then? Is it, is it just something you found? So, so my focus remained very much on type one diabetes for exactly the reason that you said, but perhaps unusually uh, um, from the mid 1990s, which is when I started in, in that role, uh, we also had a program for people newly diagnosed with type two diabetes who had come along to our institution and be educated in, in the management. Um, so I always had that interest and that exposure to people with type 2 diabetes. But you're right, unless they developed more complex problems, usually they were managed by their GPs. Um, and so we did have people coming to our clinics with type 2 diabetes. And it was my interaction with them when um, I feel I saw the light and realized that there was a better way of doing things. And just just for those that don't know, and most most people here probably are aware, what what is the standard medical model for treating diabetes uh, today, even in twenty twenty two? And then let's talk about what you think might be problematic with that. So the the the, the, the standard uh, message around type two diabetes is that this is a condition that results um, largely from our modern day lifestyles and. Um, until relatively recently, it was felt that, uh, you know, once you've got it, you've got it for life and it's just going to get worse and worse. And if you live long enough, you will need require insulin treatments. But along the way, there are tablet treatments you can take and the aim is to try and stop things getting too bad. People are usually then told about all the horrible complications that can occur as a result of uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Um, so 
you know, the standard medical model is actually using medications. Yes, people are advised on a diet, but it's usually a low-fat diet and by definition, therefore, high carbohydrate. And in truth, um, many people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in the UK and from my discussions in many other places, they're given very little decent information about diet. The focus is on medications. Um, and until I started looking into this, I... I was the same. I never asked people about what they ate. I thought it didn't really make much difference. Things are just going to get worse. And we need to just find, you know, the newest or the the, the better medication for, for, for those individuals. Um, and if you look at any of the guidelines that are produced um, from organizations around the world to guide doctors in managing type 2 diabetes, there's always a line right at the top, which says focus on diet and exercise or lifestyle. But then it's page after page about all the different medications you can use. And I think that paradigm is still what most people are um, exposed to. It's still, it's what they were taught when they learned their medicine. Um, and although we've known for 10 years, at least now, that type 2 diabetes can be reversed, that lifestyle really change really can make a difference, um, I'm still coming across a lot of people um, in all branches of medicine who just either don't believe it or aren't aware of it and just carry on in the same old way. You know, and I, you know, I went into orthopedics because I didn't want to deal with patient noncompliance. And I saw that, you know, I would, I would say, well, all these people in primary care, they never get better. They either, they're, they're not compliant. They don't want to exercise. They don't take their pills on time. And that was kind of my attitude. And that's, I'm going to go to orthopedics and somebody breaks your bone. I can put some steel, you know, metal rod down there and, I'm done and the business, but it, it, it turns out that that wasn't necessarily true. I don't think. And I found in my career, I'm just treating the same thing as you guys are just chronic disease, but it turns into arthritis and, you know, tendonitis. And it's just, it's just basically lifestyle related disease showing up with orthopedic problems. But when you, um, you know, the, the, so the medical model is continuing to advance. We now have, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, GLP one agonists and SGLT two inhibitors and so on and so forth. So the, and it's still, we're kind of chasing our tail with that stuff. Um, are you, are, are, do you feel that these new newest generation of drugs, you know, it was forever. It was, you know, the, the, the uh, sulfonylureas, which are kind of a disaster now, it turns out. And then, you know, in the metformins and all this stuff, do you think the new drugs are going to change the paradigm? And I know we're using GLP-1 agonists as weight loss drugs now, and it, it's being touted as the, so, the savior. So yeah, so so I'm not anti-drugs. I mean, there are some people who uh, share my sort of views around lifestyle who who sort of see the whole pharmaceutical industry as as one big conspiracy to keep us all ill. And while I'm not here to defend them, and I I, I don't, I think we have to recognise that um, there are a lot of medications out there that keep people alive who otherwise wouldn't be. You know, insulin being one of them. Okay, it's a it's a hormone, but we require. Um, you know, the pharma to produce it and make it available. Um, so uh, I j just those last two that you mentioned, GLP-1 and uh, agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, I think they have their place. And I, I, I do prescribe those. I probably prescribe more GLP-1s than, than SGLT2s for, for, for different reasons. Um, but I think we have to recognise that <clears throat> um, while we you know, we can accept and we can recommend that people make changes to their diets. We have to recognize that we live in an environment where the food that people are surrounded by make, can make it really, really difficult um, for people to maintain, um, you know, that, 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 that diet. And there may be occasions, you know, then, and that's even before we start thinking about things like food addiction and the, ver the various other factors that determine what people eat. Um, and so, you know, SGLT2, some people will use them for times when they are eating more carbohydrates than, than ideally they would or they would want to. And GLP-1s can be really helpful to help people who need to lose weight. And, you know, they do have an effect in reducing appetite um, that can, you know, can really make a difference. And I have a number of people where, you know, it, that medication makes it easier for them to maintain a, a, a low carbohydrate diet, which is essentially what I advocate or a ketogenic diet. Um, and, you know, hopefully at some stage they can come off it, but um, they do have their role. Yeah. I mean, look at GLP-1, glucagon, like peptide, it has a profound satiety effect or satiation effect. And I, I wonder, you know, cause we see with bariatric surgery, uh, 
out how to beat it. You know, the food addicts, you know, I'm just wondering if there'll be, you know, I guess the answer is I'm just not going to take my medication today. That's, that's always, a, you know, that you can become, uh, you know, consciously non-compliant or you maybe figure out around a way to eat around that. Cause it seems like people that are addicted do uh, <laughs> whatever it takes to, to feed that addiction, I suppose. Um, so let's talk a little bit about diets. So low carb diets are, I think the American Diabetes Association now recognizes it as a, a potential therapeutic option, but it's not promoted. It just says, you know, you can do this. Is the UK similar in that, in that regard? The UK, uh, yeah, the UK is probably a little bit behind. Our equivalent is an organization called Diabetes UK, which, uh, a bit like the ADA, they do recognize that some people will be helped by a low-carbohydrate diet, and they now have information about it on their website, but they're very conflicted, and you'll find other sections of their advice which recommends that you need carbohydrates for energy and you know, base your meals around starchy carbohydrates. So it is a real minefield, and um, I think the great, the great advantage that you have in the U.S. is I, I believe that the, the current uh, CEO of the American Diabetes Association is a person with type 2 diabetes who has personal experience of uh, the effect of changing lifestyle. Um, and I think, you know, th that really has, has helped move things forward uh, within, within the U.S. Yeah, I but, it, it, but it, it's, it's, it's difficult. It is. There's a, there is a... Uh, you know, I, I'm a doctor. I've been a doctor for a very long time. The medical profession can be extremely conservative um, and reluctant to change. And they don't like admitting that they maybe were doing the, the wrong things for many years or whatever the reasons might be. Um, or they, you know, a lot of their funding comes from, from drug manufacturers. Um, so they're, they're, they're loath to move away from drugs. I don't know, but for, the, for whatever reason, um, you know, the, a, a lot of the, real, you know, the big sort of opinion leaders uh, are slow to change. Yeah. I mean, the, the person you had mentioned, I think it was Dr. Tracy Ward, but I may be wrong on the name, but I think she's now stepped down as the, as the, uh, the president okay. and CEO of, of diabetes, American diabetes. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe her views were not consistent with the overall goals of the organization. I don't know, but she's no longer in that position, but yes, yeah, she did okay. have an impact on that. Um, when, uh, you know, the concern, you know, with the, the folks saying, you know, you have to have 130 grams of carbohydrate or whatever it is to run your brain. I mean, I had steak and eggs for breakfast, you know, and I, I haven't had any carbohydrates. My brain arguably is still working. I don't know. Some people would, would say otherwise, perhaps. But uh, what is the concern? So with uh, diabetes in particular, when we look at cardiovascular disease, you know, you're gonna, if you're going to low carbohydrate diet, um, there is a, lot, a larger chance that you're going to see an increase in LDL cholesterol, maybe your ApoB number goes up as well. Um, and, and people will say, well, that's going to give you heart disease, particularly if you're a diabetic. What are your thoughts around that? So that's, that's a really good question, and this something this is something that is, is often thrown at people like myself. Um, so... What I would say is, if you look at if you look at the evidence and and the you know the big sort of data series that have come out of people like Verta Health out of um, you know certain practices in the UK, that um, you know on average lipid profiles improve. Yes, the total cholesterol level may go up a bit. Yes, LDL may go up a bit. But the things that really matter, you know, triglycerides come tumbling down. HDL uh, uh, it goes up far more than, than than LDL and the net effect is a beneficial improvement in lipid profile that's the first thing um, the, to say the second thing is yes but then we have to accept there are people so-called hyper responders who may see a very big rise in in in, in LDL and you know there are now, um, you know, I've, I, I've had discussions with lipid specialists in the UK who are open minded and will say, well, yeah, OK, we have an issue here where conventionally their lipid profile is looking like it's heading toward a heart attack. But, you know, they've lost 100 pounds in weight. Their blood pressure's come right down. Um, you know, they, their glucose control has, has improved significantly um, and all they've, they've, they've reversed their diabetes. So putting it all into the, the, the mix uh, it may be not quite as as significant as we think, um, but then there's this whole, if you like, other issue, which which is actually to say, well, 
actually, have we got it right? You know, is it really the case that a high high LDL um, is that is that dangerous? And I don't consider my an expert myself an expert in this, but you know, I've seen sufficient data now which really I think calls into question our rather simplistic understanding that we've had up till now. And you know, if I encounter someone who's, you know, they're on a low carbohydrate diet, they reverse their diabetes, they've lost lots of weight, but they're, you know, their their lipid profiles are, are, are looking a bit unhealthy as we believe them, I would just have a very open discussion with them as to what their goals are, what's important to them. And yeah, you know, there may, may be some people who want to take medication to reduce it because that, you know, that's consistent with what they think is important. And I actually don't have a problem with that. Yeah. I mean, there's some people who say, yeah, it's all fine. You lost weight, your diabetes went away, your blood pressure is normalized. Your LDL cholesterol is twice what it needs to be. So let's just throw you on a stat and call it even and and, and you're good to go. Um, you know, if you look at the traditional model, you know, number of particles, the more ApoB particles you have, the higher risk you have. But there's another side of that equation is what causes it to stick to the vessels. And there's, you know, the proteoglycan, um, uh, you know, levels change, you know, the, and, and that can be dependent upon what's going on in the else, else on the diet. So I think there's two sides of that. So it's an interesting discussion. And I, I, I like you, I don't know that we, it, it's as simplistic as people will say, you know, more particles, more disease, always end of story. I think it's all things being equal, maybe, but all things are never equal. And that's the, yeah, that's the, that's the that's right. thing there. What, um, so in your practice, um, as a, you know, like I said, as an endocrinologist, uh, how, uh, how much of your practice is type two diabetes and w- what are the outcomes? Like what are, what are the, tradi- what are the standard outcomes for type two diabetics or even type one diabetics with regard to perhaps let's say hemoglobin A1C. I know the targets are in my view, not very, you know, aggressive. They're pretty, pretty, pretty weak targets. I think where, where do your numbers looked at for versus say your peers? Um, that, that's a really good question. It's one that I can't really answer. So I should explain that my clinical practice is now a very small amount of my, you know, I spend, I have a relatively small clinical practice because uh, I spend my other time on project work and writing and and, and, and so on and so forth. But um, my people who I, um, either if they choose to come come to see me, then they're looking for outcomes that might be very different. You know, they're looking, after they've got type 2 diabetes, they're looking to reverse their diabetes. They're not going to be happy with an HbA1c of 7%. You know, they want it down below 6%. And, um, you know, if that's their goal, then I will support them to use the method that they feel most works for them to, to help, help them achieve that. Um, it, um, anecdotally, um, as is often the case, you know, in, in 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 the practice I work, there are a number of other other physicians, and when they see the impact that that this approach has, then argue with the numbers, you know, and say, say well, you know, you've achieved, you know, what this person's achieved, you know, they've put their diabetes to remission, they've lost twenty pounds in weight. Um, at, and it sort of spreads. It sort of spreads around, and there's a bit of you know influencing uh, positively, hopefully. Um, rather, whereas if I were just to go in there and say, "Well, look, this is the approach I I would advocate," um, um, there's often a lot of, a lot of skepticism. Skepticism because there is this belief that it doesn't really work, or not many people can can achieve it. Um, similarly, in type one diabetes. Um, a, a number of my patients will actively choose a low carbohydrate diet to help them achieve better outcomes. And uh, anyone with type one diabetes who is overweight, and that you know quite a lot of them are, often because they've been on big doses of insulin for many years. You know, I'm very upfront. I say, well, the only way that I know, as someone who injects insulin, that you can lose weight is to inject less insulin. And the only way you can safely inject less insulin is to eat less carbohydrate. And so, um, you know, that, again, can be really, really effective in people who uh, with, with type 1 diabetes as well. Although, of course, they're never going to get rid of their diabetes, but they can achieve much better outcomes, weight and HbA1c and insulin requirement um, by making dietary changes. There is this notion um and I think it's probably the same in the US in type one diabetes that actually uh, it's a hormone deficiency. So you just need to replace the hormone, which is insulin. And that means you can eat whatever you like. You just need to give the right amount of insulin. 
And I went along that for a long period of, period of time. And I was saying to people, yeah, you can eat whatever you like, you know, just need to give the right amount of insulin. Uh, it just doesn't work. And I think that we're realising that, especially as more and more people are wearing CGMs and other means that will show minute by minute what's happening to their glucose levels, uh, especially after meals, even if they're injecting insulin, it doesn't get it. So I think increasingly people with type 1 diabetes will be adopting this sort of approach and realising that they do need to, um, or, or, or that modifying their diet can really contribute to better outcomes. It's interesting, and I've, I've, I've met with a number of type 1 diabetics, and, and most of them uh, prefer the older forms of insulin. You know, you've got these ultra-rapid-acting insulins that are designed for basically carbohydrates. And if you're eating a low-carb diet, protein and fat, the regular ins insulin profile seems to match very nicely the, the absorption characteristics of, say, a, yeah. let's say a steak or something like that. And so that's... Uh, it's interesting, and I, you know, I, I get, you know, it's not exact, it's not being secreted from the pancreas, but it's being absorbed through the subcutaneous tissues. And I, I don't know if there's, you know, it, maybe it's a hint saying, hey, this is normal insulin that, that our body makes more or less, and it, this is this is the uh, character, you know, the the characteristics of that, and maybe the food matches it for a reason. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think we've got to be aware that the injected insulin is very, very different. As you say, you know, it, it, it you know, in, in, with a normal functioning pancreas, the insulin is hitting the portal vein at the same time as the food is hitting it at exactly the right amount, exactly the right time. Um, and it works by and large really well if you're, if you are metabolically healthy in type one diabetes, you're having to inject insulin. It's going to get them through the skin, through the peripheral circulation. And at some point, we'll, we'll hit the food that's coming from the gut somewhere in the body. And it's a lottery. And yes, you're right, a slower acting um, regular insulin may, may be more appropriate for people on a higher a higher protein meal. Um, there's not a lot of usage of those insulins in the UK. But, um, but you know, I, I, I get it that, 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 that some people find it works really, really well um, in, 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 in the way that you said. Um, but I think what we're also recognizing, especially when is that people are having using these CGMs, is that, you know, even the rapid acting insulins with, you know, rapid in their name, they're not they're not that rapid. You know, they actually work really quite slowly for the very reason I said, you know, they've got to get from the periphery right into where the action is. And that can take quite some time. Yeah, I think some people are a little, little injected IM, or I've even heard people injecting it into a, into a vein, you know, just to, just to get that. Well, I've got the inhaled versions as well, which I guess speed up the absorption. Um, what, um, you know, as far as uh, uh, when you're doing this stuff in the community, have you run across resistance from, from, from colleagues, from peers, from consultants that you refer to or refer from? Has that been a problem for you? Um, I have done in the past. Um, I have come across, uh, in particular, some dietitians or uh, nutritionists who um, <laughs> have in the past been very wedded to this idea, you have to have 130 grams of carbohydrate a day, otherwise your brain will suffer. It, it, you know, and I think they were trained in that. So it's, I, it's an understandable if someone's coming along and say, well, actually, no, the brain can cope fine because your body can feed it in other ways or it can make its glucose from other other sources um and so yeah i have experienced uh, i have experienced resistance uh, fortunately i now you know pretty much work with people who think in a similar way to me uh and so that is that is less of less of an issue um i i, I do run run training programs for professionals to introduce them to this approach uh and um, you know, sometimes be people coming who are still very rude, but um, you know, at least they've come along, they've exposed them, you know, they may realize there is a different thing. Do you, so if somebody comes to you as a um, you know, type two diabetic, you know, you know, often overweight, how do you how do you how do you typically manage them? Do you have a uh, a system in place, a system of, uh, you know, because a lot of it, you know, the lifestyle stuff is not well addressed in a, in a typical 15 minute visit as, as the average physician seems to have even less when you consider all the paperwork and, you know, com, you know, the, the stuff you have to do. So how do you, how, how would someone manage that in, in your practice? So I always ask people what their own goals are. Uh, because, you know, we have to acknowledge is, you know, a person with type two diabetes, um, 
they're the person managing it. And so, there's, yeah, I could say, well, you should do this, this, and this. You shouldn't eat that. You should take that tablet. But if that doesn't meet with their goals, it, 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 it's not going to happen. So the, consult, the, the initial consultation will very much focus on, on what their goals are. Now, very often, they are to lose weight, to reduce medications, and to get blood, better blood sugar levels. Um, and so I... You know, unusually, I, I, I guess for, for a physician, I spend some time actually asking them what they, you know, what do you eat? And I go, you know, I don't do a formal diet diet history. I wouldn't know how to, but I just ask very simply, give me an idea. What are the sort of things you like to eat for breakfast, for lunch, for your main meals? What do you have for snacks and what, what do you like to drink? And then use that once I know exactly what they're eating or what they're choosing to me to suggest some some really tangible alternatives um, that, you know, that are then going to be relevant to them because, you know, there's no point suggesting that, 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 that people have steak every morning for breakfast if they're a vegetarian, for example. I mean, you know, we can argue their benefit, whether that's an appropriate um, way, way of, you know, type type of nutrition anyway. But, but, so, but, but taking people, you know, according to their own lifestyle, their own choices, their goals, and providing some very specific um, alternatives that they can try straight away. Um, and I, I used to give them my own materials. We've now got some really good websites with, you know, lots of material far better than I can produce. So I always send them an email, you know, with links to, to some, some key websites, which has, 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 you know, exactly the, the type of information that, 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 that I advocate and I recommend. Um, and I'd start, I'd start them off, you know, if they're, if they're a bit reticent, I'd just say, well, just try as an experiment, you know, instead of having your bowl of cereal for breakfast, try having some eggs or try having some plain Greek yogurt um, and just see, you know, see the difference. It may mean you don't need to take any insulin with it if they're on insulin. Um, and rather than a, you know, a very prescriptive dietary plan that, you know, right, you've got to get down to 30 grams of carbohydrate and you do it on this day and this is what you can eat and this is what you can't. Um, very much provide them with the information. And I say your focus is, is we want you to encourage you to eat foods that will not push up your blood sugars. And that basically means anything with sugar in or anything with, with more than just a small amount of starchy carbohydrate and let them people find their own their own pattern. Um, and... Yeah, if they're, if, you know, that that will often work work really, really well. And I have some people who have been able to reverse their diabetes, but they still have a small amount of cereal every morning because that's important to them and their body can manage it. Um, you know, even though a purist would say, well, you, you know, that, that, ain't, that ain't a low-carb diet. Um, and uh, so that's very much, much the, the approach that I take. Um, and uh, obviously there are other things that you need to look at, things like blood pressure and um, you know, the complication screening, but the bulk of my initial consultation is talking about food and lifestyle. Do you uh, pay any attention to uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Is that something that you work it, look into? Is that part of your consideration? So, so almost by definition, you know, I think our current, my understanding of type 2 diabetes is that the metabolic abnormalities are a result from excess fat in the liver. Um, so whether that can be demonstrated on a scan or not, you know, I think there's pretty good cons accepted consensus now that it's accumulation of, of, of fat in the liver that, that is associated or to, with the insulin resistance, which is part of type 2 diabetes. So without actually labelling people or, or, or specifically looking at it, um, yeah, by definition, I think my approach assumes everyone has a degree of excess fat in the liver. Um, and our goal is to reduce that through lifestyle change. And I guess without measuring, it's hard to say. I mean, I guess you could look at like a, uh, uh, I think it's fatty liver index with triglycerides and GGT and waist circumference. Yeah. BMI, things like that. I mean, is that is that something you look at? So, so yeah, we will we'll routinely mo monitor all of those, you know, the liver enzymes, and very often the, the, the gamma GT uh, uh, and, and the AL ALT will be raised, but often they won't be. But that, to me, won't it signify that they don't have excess fat in the liver because we know that that is part of uh, the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. So, um uh, yeah, yeah. So we'll, you know, we'll monitor those things. 
and um, you know, usually see see quite significant improvements. There's a quite one of our members has asked a question about pancreatic stem cell, uh, I guess transfers uh, or. Is there any, any any evidence that that I know that that's kind of still very much a research thing? Do you feel that's a viable option for either type ones or I guess burnout type twos? Is that something that's going to happen down the road? So potentially for type one diabetes, where you know the really the only issue, well, the, the by far the predominant the predominant issue is lack of secretion of insulin from the pancreatic cells, and if you can replace those with uh, functioning insulin secreting cells, then that's a you know that, that is a potential cure, and that's you know a, a huge amount of research work has been going into that type of approach for a, 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 a very long time. Um, for the vast majority of people with type two diabetes, it's just missing the point because the point is in type two diabetes not that you can't produce it, insulin, but your body can't use it, um, hence insulin resistance. So that's why it's you know. Part of my management plan is that people are on insulin. Say, well, look, if you want, you know, if it meets with your goals of losing weight, coming off medications, we've got to get you off insulin as much as we can, because that's just going to be making the problem worse. Um, with the exception of um, that, probably relatively small a number of people who would be classed as having type two diabetes, but they are insulin, they are insulin deficient. Um, so, yeah, you could argue that. You know, some sort of in, uh, in, uh, insulin stem cell replacement could be could be useful for them, um, but that would be a very small minority of people with type two diabetes, in my experience. Type one diabetes, you know, it used, we used to you know d- distinguish this between adult onset and juvenile onset, but now we're seeing obviously type two diabetes occurring in, in kids. We're also seeing type one diabetes and, and some various different versions, type one and a half, and a lot of things like that occurring in adults. Why are we seeing the autoimmune versions seem seemingly increasing in adults? What is going on there? Do you have any idea what might be leading to that? Um, I don't know any data which is showing uh, conclusively that there, is, that there is a big increase in autoimmune type one diabetes in older age groups because we've known we've always known. You're absolutely right. So when I when I learned my medicine, I was told well, people up to the age of forty are likely to have type one. Over the age of forty, it's likely to be type two. But we always knew you could get type one diabetes at any age. Um, what I think is that as a large number of them had very slow onset type 1 diabetes, or one is often called LADA, um, that they were misdiagnosed as type 2 diabetes and they were put on pills treated for type 2 diabetes and often there's still residual insulin secretion for several years. Um, and it's only been more recently when we've had been more readily available to measure the antibodies that distinguish type 1 diabetes and all being able to measure insulin levels that I think we're probably much better at identifying those people than we were um, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, so, so while there has been a general increase in autoimmune disease and in, I think, absolute numbers of type 1 diabetes, I'm not sure that's necessarily been more in the elder age group, uh, just that we're better able to to, to identify it and manage it uh, than we were in the past. I've, I've read some data on st- some long-standing di- type 1 diabetics, you know, 30 years plus, and they still maintain a small amount of insulin secretion. And some thought is, it's, you know, because we hear the, ins- the, the, you know, the beta cells are dead, but maybe they're not dead, but they've they sort of uh, de-differentiated into, you know, kind of a a more precursor cell it doesn't it lost it's not dead but it's lost the insulin secretory capacity is that true and are they working on anything that might cause those cells to redifferentiate back into into functioning beta cells so i i would agree with you and i think that there are people who've had type 1 diabetes for a very long time who are you know on very low doses of insulin and by our conventional wisdom they have to be producing some uh, some insulin and I think it probably just means we don't fully understand what's going on and that just as our old understanding about lipids was very simplistic I think our, our understanding about type 1 diabetes is very simplistic I'm not aware of any specific research as you as, as you describe but you know there are reports um, in, in 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 Hungary there's a there's a group that you know has demonstrated reversal of type 1 diabetes in some people with particular dietary interventions which goes against everything that we understand and have taught. So I'm open to the fact that 
that that in type one diabetes or certain people with type one diabetes, um, the, the the suppression of insulin secretion could in some way be reversible. Um, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert in, in commenting anymore, but just that it is, you know, it is one of those unknowns or one of those questions that I think we need to look into uh, more in more detail. Yeah, I, uh, I'm familiar with uh, that group, Paleo Medicina, Sophia Clements, Jabatov, sure. I've talked to them extensively, and I've actually seen within this crazy carnivore community of ours, we've seen a number of, uh, not a lot, but a, a handful of type 1 diabetics who have been able to come off their insulin, which I think is, you know, and the question is, were you properly diagnosed? Did you have some other, you know, maybe it wasn't fully diagnosed correctly, but I don't know, the possibility is interesting. Um, what do you think the, uh, the so in the UK, what you're doing, this, this lower carb approach, this lifestyle approach to diabetes and, and quite frankly, other disease, is it gaining traction where you are? Or do you feel that, you know, you're, you're, you're still swimming very much upstream? Has it, has it gotten better? Do you think? It, 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 it's really gaining traction. Um, it, it, it really is. And um, there are most of that traction that has actually come from people in primary care, from from general practitioners. Um, there's a guy who I'm, many people may have heard of called David Dr. Unwin uh, from the north of England who um, started his his journey in, in, into this approach to type two diabetes. Started at a very similar time to mine, but he, you know, he works in in primary care and he's been able to network with primary care physicians around the country and provide resources that have supported very large numbers now of of GPs who are dealing with it um, and changing their practice and seeing really good outcomes and in a sense that's great and you know specialists like me I'm, I'm one of I think very few um, who, people who are um, you know who who will actively use this approach or advocate this approach I, I'm, I am finding a few more friends uh, uh, and, and, and colleagues who, who share my belief that, that we should be using this approach in type 2 diabetes but I think very often and people get very angry with endocrinologists and saying, well, why aren't they doing this, that, and the other? But as you said at the beginning, you know, they would see that actually their role is, is, is much more dealing with the medical aspects of type 2 diabetes and looking after people with type 1 diabetes and, and the type 2 diabetes. Otherwise, you know, it is the GPs who are appropriately managing it. So I think the fact that there are GPs now all over the country who are changing their practice is really good news. Um, there seems to be a relationship. Well, there clearly is a relationship. Uh, maybe you can expound upon this a little bit more between thyroid function and type two diabetes. Um, can you talk about any relationship that's there? And do you, are the, do they often sort of cohabit each other? Thyroid issues with diabetes? Yeah. Yes, they do. So, so thyroid issues. I mean, thyroid disease is, is is almost always an autoimmune condition. It can lead to it to too much or too little thyroid hormone production. And, and hypothyroidism, where where there's not enough, is, is is the more common. They're actually very common in the general population anyway, but they are more more represented in people with type one diabetes because autoimmune diseases will will, will often you know uh, occur uh, together. Um, and in type two diabetes, I, I I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of data showing that that hypothyroidism is significantly more frequent in people with type 2 diabetes but they are both very very common conditions and i think it, it you know the fact that they're very common they will often uh, co-occur um but it's important to you know it's important to recognize and to be aware because um it, you know they can influence each other um a disturbance of thyroid metabolism um, you know, can you interact with lipids and interact with, with glucose metabolism. So it's really important to keep a handle and to, to be aware to, to, to monitor thyroid function. Do we see, um, this is not much talk, but obviously, you know, one of the sort of the counter-regulatory hormones from insulin is glucagon and it's sitting there right next to the beta cells and the alpha cells. Do we ever, do we see a lot of glucagon diseases or dysfunction? Do we know much about that? <laughs> So, I, I guess the short answer to the question is no. We don't know much about it. So there are there are rare diseases of um, excess production of glucagon, uh, which is a sort of in the endocrinology small prints glucogonomas, um, which you know will be diagnosed from time to time. Um, there is 
Um, it, it can be a particular issue, uh, I think, in people with type 1 diabetes because part of the role of insulin is to control glucagon. Um, and, um, you know, there has been a school of thought that within type 1 diabetes, we've got to be looking at trying to manage glucagon as, 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 well, as well as insulin. And one of the one of the um, advantages of using uh, GLP-1 analogs is, is is they can reduce glucagon. Um, and although it's not it's not recognised as a mainstream management for type one diabetes, I've seen people with type one diabetes do really well uh, with GLP one. So I, I think it's probably because it is modifying their glucagon response. Interesting. Do you um, you obviously see a lot of autoimmune conditions as they manifest in the endocrine system, whether it's Hashimoto's, Graves, type one diabetes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe Addison's disease. I can't remember if that's autoimmune or not, but do you feel that there is a uh, part of the pathogenesis of autoimmune disease is gut physiology or pathology? Do you think there's any relationship there? Um, so uh, my traditional training will tell me absolutely not. It's got nothing to do with that. Um, what I'm what I'm learning is it might well have something to do with it. And so I am on a I, you know I'm on a learning curve really um, to because um, you know there are uh, there are people with other autoimmune diseases who are seeing you know really good outcomes through changes in their diet to things that are going to help their microbiome and and so on and so forth improve leaky gut um, and so you know to me this is really really exciting because it opens a possibility that that again, you know, just as we, 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 we've we um, always, or up until 10 years ago, have understood that type 2 diabetes is a, you know, once you've got it, you've got it for life. People with autoimmune diseases are pretty much told the same, but if there are modifications that they can make uh, to improve their gut health and to improve their gut physiology that will have a beneficial impact on their autoimmunity, um, well, you know, I, I know that it can be really, really helpful. So um, it's sort of out of my area, but it's something that um, I'm, I'm looking closely at and learning from practitioners in those fields. Yeah, I mean, just just to share, I see it almost daily, uh, you know, whether it's thyroiditis or Crohn's or, or ulcer colitis, which obviously would make sense. It shocks me that gastroenterologists tell people that these inflammatory bowel diseases have nothing to do with diet, which I, I just, it, it's, I'm befuddled by how you couldn't think that, but I see that very regularly. And I think yeah. there's a there's a, a researcher, Alessio Fazano at Boston Children, who's done a lot of research around gut hyperpermeability and its association with autoimmune disease. So it's it's certainly there's 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 you know mechanisms which have been described which which seem to be plausible. Um you, so tell me, because you said you're kind of you're 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 not doing as much clinical practice as you've scaled that back. What is the rest of your time? You said you're writing and speaking and that type of stuff. So tell me a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So um, so uh, around um, ten years ago, uh, I so the background is within my work. I've always had a very high focus on patient education, on developing programs to help people manage their diabetes, both in type one and type two diabetes. So around ten years ago, now I was asked to to to, to write a book. Uh, for people with type type two diabetes, um, and it's when this whole reversal thing came about, and I'd been, you know, started to use low carb to help people. Um, so I made that first, and you know, bang center of part of the you know, the theme of that book. It was called Reverse Your Diabetes, and since then I've I've now written a number of works for people with type one and type two diabetes. And if you allow me, before we finish, I'd like to I'd like to make a plug because Amazon US has got a good offer on on my latest book. Um, um, so, so writing is an important part, but also um, in 2013, I, I left the UK. I went to work for the International Diabetes Federation based in, in Brussels, Belgium. And I spent three years as director of programs for them. And um, that's an organization that, that has a global reach and is looking really to support and serve those countries um, low-income countries in different parts of the world largely who don't have a well-functioning you know infrastructure either within medical services or advocacy such as the ada would do in the U us or diabetes uk would do in the in, in, in the uk 
So that really opened my eyes to um, the plight of people with diabetes across the world, and to particularly Africa. Um, and to cut a long story short, off, on the back of that, uh, I've been involved in helping set up programs to uh, manage type 2 diabetes in Kenya and in the Congo uh, with local physicians there. Um, a bit nearer to home for you guys, I spent some time in Bermuda working with the Bermuda Diabetes Association. Um, it was a very small island, two hours out of um, uh, Boston in the mid-Atlantic with a very high, they got an even higher uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the US and um, it's you know it's, it's it's the environment it's a food environment so I have an ongoing project there um, with, which I sort of tap into remotely now I don't go there on a regular basis um, <clears throat> but I am particularly uh, you know so 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 this is very much my focus wanting to particularly in places like you know in Africa where you know, people can't afford medication. So saying you should go on a GLP-1 is just a non-starter for the majority of the population. The good news in those places is that the healthy foods are actually quite easily affordable. You know, unlike places like Bermuda, unlike maybe perhaps parts of the US, um, where the healthier option is more expensive. Um, so it's, it's getting people to adapt their diet. And what's really exciting um, in, in Kenya, the, the, the traditional diet is very high in starchy carbohydrates. And yet, despite that, people have been able to reduce that part of their diet and focus on other parts of their diet. And, you know, my colleagues there have seen, you know, real, real good outcomes, people reversing their diabetes um, and, of course, not having, not having the cost of medications. Yeah, that's it's an interesting perspective because some people these drugs are not an option at all. Just, they're just prohibitively expensive and, you know, they don't have the infrastructure to, to sort of probably get that distributed, uh, although I'm sure some of the companies would love to be able to do that eventually. Um, you, so are you finding any countries that are, you know, like we, like we would say, you know, the U S is probably doing a fairly abysmal job at managing a lot of chronic disease, particularly diabetes. Are any countries doing it really well that you've been exposed to? I mean, you've said you've got a bit of a global exposure, any countries. That sort of yeah. That? So, so, um, I don't think anyone's doing it really well. I think in type two, in respect of type two diabetes, the countries that are doing well are the ones who are take, who are really recognizing that this isn't a medical issue; it's a food environment issue, and uh, and or physical environment issue, and they're doing things. They're taking steps to change that. Um, you know, I can think of so. Um, um within within uh, Amsterdam in, in the Netherlands um they, they they they've made huge progress in in influencing childhood nutrition um you know with more public health type approaches and seeing uh, you know child obesity improve and um you know it, it's that type of intervention that is going to have the long lasting effect because if you can if you can modify the lifestyles in children, then that's reducing the impact or the likelihood of diabetes in later life. Um, otherwise, if we're looking at the more medical aspects, I think that the whole world is still a bit too gripped by this idea that you know, it needs medication. So uh, type 2 diabetes is a, is, a, is a thing that needs medication. Um, so there's a, there's a long way to go, but there are pockets of really good practice, particularly looking at uh, uh, at the environment that, that leads to these conditions as, pro, as what's called primordial prevention. When I look at, you know, some of the, the sort of uh, information is putting out, you know, particularly kids are being told, um, uh, you know, you should be eating a plant book. It's basically a low fat diet, a lot of fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, legumes, whole grains, meat you should have very sparingly this obviously is, is not consistent with a low carbohydrate diet and the people that are advocates of this will say well the reason we have type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance is because of the fat we're consuming is now becoming you know infiltrating our cells and they now become uh, they, they modify the insulin receptor so it's not no longer as, as sensitive through things like ceramides and they blame it on you know the saturated fat in the blood like pulmonic acid um what do you say in response to that well, I think I'd agree with you that, um, and and you know there are, there are well, I, you know, quite shocking examples of you know, where schools are eliminating meat from their diets um, from the kids, you know, from the food 
into their feeding their kids because you know they, they they they've been fed this idea that you know that's that's healthy um and i think we, we you know we need to recognize we're up against uh, another whole industry which is promoting if you like fake food in terms of fake meats and, and, and other products i think where 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 there is general agreement though is that what this idea of avoiding ultra processed foods and focusing on natural foods and yes that will still include thing you know uh, uh, fruit and vegetables and, and and whole grains and so on but if at least we can try and minimize the intake of the ultra processed foods um you know the very high sugar foods and and, and, and so on then it's going to be a step in the right direction um other than that yeah it, it it needs society really i think to get its act together in a way that it doesn't it doesn't seem very much able to at the moment to actually begin to recognize well what is food you know and you know if it's in a packet with and it's in a and it's in a grocery store then it's food well no it isn't you know very often it's it's chemicals masquerading as, as food that are designed to become be, be hyper palatable wanting you to eat a lot of it with very little regard for what it's doing for you inside yeah i think the problem a lot of us see is you know most people don't want to make a change until the pain is too unbearable and you know that you know that's why many people that I run into are 40, 50 years of age because they they've you know 20 they don't care because I can eat whatever I want and I still feel pretty good. Um and I think that's a big issue. Um we are unfortunately running out of time. Uh okay. I want you to go ahead and tell us about your books and, and the information you wanted to share with us. So if you go ahead and do that, it'd be great. Well, just 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 very, very quickly. So so um my most recent book is called Busting the Diabetes Myth. The natural way to reverse type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. Uh, it's got first-hand accounts of people from around the world who've reversed their diabetes using the sort of approach that I advocate. And the only reason it's relevant is that Amazon in the US is now offering it at $1.99 in Kindle version. I don't think the physical version is available there yet. So uh, if that's of interest to anyone, then please uh, please download, buy it and download it. Let me ask you just one quick question. When we talk about when we mention reversing diabetes. Hey, my, my hemoglobin yeah. A1C is five. I'm happy. Uh, I don't get big blood glucose spikes. The critics will say you have not reversed your diabetes. You've just masked it because you're eating a low carb diet. And then if I give you an oral glucose yeah. tolerance test and give you a slug of 75 or 100 grams of pure glucose, you're going to have a big spike. How do you respond to that? Uh, it's 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 a really good point, and um, I, I I I do use the word word reversal uh, because I think it, it resonates with people, and it, and and they understand that because of changes they can make, they can. What I say is, you're reversing the diabetes disease process because we know that that that's what happens. Now, um, you might reverse it completely, and you then go into what's called remission. Um, and you've reversed your diabetes, or you might have reversed it partially. You've still got diabetes, but you've lost a lot of weight. You've come off medication, and your, your sugar levels are much better. But you're absolutely right. The initial definition of reversal was a normal glucose tolerance test. So uh, Ry Taylor and colleagues here in the UK who, who did a lot of these groundbreaking work, um, reversal was normal glucose tolerance tests, and I would still stand by that. And uh, but but. The definitions of change, we now talk about remission. We talk about remission being defined by an HbA1c. And I fully say, and I would say to people, yes, you can achieve remission, which means keeping your HbA1c down below 6.5% for at least six months with no medication. But if you go back into your old ways, then you risk going, going, you know, going back into the diabetes territory. So it's very clear that people understand that and it's not a cure. Um, but I think to use reversal or reversing as a verb i just find it, it, it it's it, it's it's language that 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 people can resonate with and um i, I still choose to use it yeah i always think where, where in nature would we ever come across 75 grams of pure glucose you know on a, <laughs> there is that there is that aspect as well <laughs> Anyway, well, I've got to run, unfortunately. David, thank you so much for, for, for number one, for being with us, but number two, for doing what you do. Keep doing what you're doing, and I wish you the best, and I hopefully we can continue all together to get this message out there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and have a good day. 
Thank you. All right, guys. We'll see you. Rest of you guys tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye bye now.